Okay, let's get started. So um, I only have a few announcements. I finally secured a grader, finally. So um, what will happen is assignments one and two are still going to be as they uh, have been posted, just pure test case based. But then assignments three through eight, those will be some part of it being test case and some of it being uh, like looking at your code, seeing how well you're formatting your code. Are you putting good comments in? Do you have good program structure? That sort of thing. Um, and the other announcement is that assignment three will probably go out Wednesday or sometime this week. And then you'll have two weeks to work on that. Any questions about assignment two or anything we've covered? Or so when's assignment two due? 30th. When, what day is that? Friday or Wednesday? Wednesday. OK. So any questions? Yeah. So is lab two still going to be due on the first? Somewhere? Yeah, all labs are due on the corresponding Friday. So yeah, on the first. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, when, so first one, like when I showed up for the lab, there wasn't a TA there. Yeah, because I've said numerous times last week that there were no labs. Yeah, <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. So lab two is due this week uh, on Friday. So do go to labs this week. There will be labs this week and every other week other than spring break. So don't come during spring break until the end of the semester. Other questions? Yeah. How does lab attendance work for this class? How does what attendance? Lab attendance. So, um, I've, so I don't, I'm not at the labs, so I don't know what happens there. But I've instructed the TAs to take attendance of people there. And then they just mark it on a shared uh, document that they have. And so the way lab grades work is uh, each lab's worth 20 points, and five of those are for attendance. The other 15 are just passing the several test cases in each of the labs. And, and we don't have any hidden test cases or anything. Everything is given to you. So if you pass everything in the uh, given lab, then you're all set. And you attend lab, then you should get full points. Other questions? Okay, so last time we were talking about decisions, right? We all make decisions, right? <laughs> so uh, the code that we've been working on so far was just straight through. We're not going to do anything special. Just read line by line and just execute it without question. Well, what decisions give us is the power to conditionally execute some code. So if something is true, Maybe the user entered some uh, number. Maybe we're implementing a guessing uh, number game. And we have some magic number that they, we want them to guess. If, if they entered the correct number, then we can say, yeah, you won the game. And then if they did not put the correct number in, then we can say, oh, you didn't uh, win the game. Try again. Should both of those options occur if, if the user enters a number where they where the output is you uh, guess the right number and you guess the wrong number, should both of those happen? No. Oh, exactly one of those will happen, no matter what the user will input. So de decisions help us do that. So if we want to ha uh, test for some condition to be true, whether the user entered the right number or the input was the right password, for example, uh, we use relational operators to test some value against another value. So it depends, of course, on the situation that we're dealing with, whether we want to test for greater than, less than, equality, or not equal to, which is the exclamation equal part. Um, but if we want to test some value against another, we use one of these operators. So we went over some examples last time. So 12 is greater than 5. Obviously, 7 less than or equal to 5 is not true, so it's false. If x has a value of 10, then if it equals 10, then that's true. And then these ones are pretty obvious from uh, just looking at the values. Um, 
if we if we can save these to a bool variable so all relational operators they give us a bool value so that it returns true or it returns false so whatever the value of x and y is uh, no matter what it returns either true or it returns false so the way that uh, and so we went over hierarchy too so an if statement's purpose is it has a condition associated with it as well as statements to execute depending on the condition. So if whatever the condition is evaluates to true, then the, the statements within the uh, if block will be executed. So if condition evaluates to true here, all end statements will be executed in here. If it's not true, none of them will be executed. And so we went over that last time. So pretty picture version. So if the condition is true, go through the statements. If not, skip them. Uh, so we, and here are some examples. So if some variable called score has a value of at least 90, then we execute both of the statements inside the if st in the if block. If it, if score is strictly less than 90, then we don't execute either of them. So if it's bigger than 90, then we set some variable grade to be uh, the character A, and then we print this uh, to the user. So if it's a keyword, uh, you must have parentheses with the condition inside of it. Did anyone test what happens if you put a semicolon after the if condition? So, well, so when I say that uh, you should try this to figure out what happens, where do you think that's going to come back up? Mm -hmm. So, do you want to see what actually happens if we did that? So let's look. So let's do let's. So let's look at this code that we had before, and let's just make it simpler and just have one if statement. So let's just uh, compile and run this code as is. So all it does is get an integer from the user, test if it's bigger than ninety, and it prints a if it's bigger than ninety. If it's not bigger than 90, what happens? Nothing. Because if this if statement's not true, then the code inside the if statement's not going to be executed. And there's nothing else after, so... And we can actually test this. Okay, yeah. Uh, let's go back to the this part. Just to make it easier. And then if we run, print 92, it prints A. If we do 89, it doesn't print anything. So it does exactly what we expect. So now I'm going to do that. So it says, do not put a semicolon after the if statement. Question for you. Is it going to compile first, first of all? So, so I have some no's and some yeses. So what do you think is a way that I can actually verify this? Try to compile it. See what happens. So ignore the warning. <laughs> so has anyone programmed for uh, Apple or iOS before? So they, oh, I'm not sure why it wants me to update right now. Um, if you try to submit an iOS app to the App Store and it has warnings in it, they're going to actually reject it automatically, it, even if it compiles completely. So warnings you should treat as errors even though they aren't actually errors, okay? So let's just be uh, like a lazy developer, I guess, <laughs> like I guess, and just say, we're gonna ignore all warnings, whatever that warning was, and we'll return to what the warning said. So let's just try to run this. Well, if I put 92, what do you think will happen? Well, it prints A just fine, no problem. 89, what do you think will happen? Ah, it'll, it prints it basically no matter what value I give it. So what do you, so what do you think, uh, what do you hypothesize as to what that means? Ah, so an if statement looks at the next statement, okay? So a block of code like this, you should think of as one giant statement in some sense. So what do you think is right here? There must be a statement right there. Right, because in if uh, part is looking for the next statement to test against, to 
whether I should execute it or not. But it seems like there's nothing there. What do you think is there? It's what's called an empty statement. So there, there is a statement right here, but it's actually an empty statement. So what inevitably happens is it executes or doesn't execute that empty statement, but then wait, so it has the, so this uh, uh, open uh, curly brace, close curly brace, so this is independent of the if statement. It's not depending on what the if statement says. So in fact, we might as well just comment the if statement out because it does nothing here. So what happens here is since there is no um, condition on these curly braces, it just blasts through the curly braces anyway. So because you should think of, even though this is not really true, you should think of the curly braces as one giant statement. So what it's doing is just blasting through the statements now and so, therefore, it always will execute this C out statement. So, what do you think we should do with semicolons and if statements? Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, so just don't do that. Um, there are very rare occasions, there's a construct like if, where we do sometimes put the semicolon afterward, but it's a very, very rare case. I've never seen in any use for an if statement for this to work. Because what we can do instead is, if we did want an empty statement for some odd reason, we can just do that instead. And that is a lot clearer than a semicolon because it's harder to see. So what I recommend is never put a semicolon after an if statement. So uh, for each of these, types of things, whenever you see something like don't do this or do this, try to understand why that's the case. Uh, so I'm not going to be spoon feeding you every single little detail about why something is true, why something is false, but whenever you see something like this and you're curious as to why this is the case, what should you do? So write a program and test it. Right. So do not place uh, semicolons after the condition is just so it's legal to do, but it's just uh, a bad idea. Um, don't forget the curly braces. So why would you want to do that? Uh, put uh, curly braces? What if we just left them, left them out? Yeah, it, it would just do the first line in, uh, after the if statement, right? And we saw an example of uh, when that can go wrong last time. Uh, what if we put... Uh, instead of double equals in the condition, we just put a single equals. What, what happened then? It's an, it's an assignment, and what does that have a default value of, as we saw? So like if we had, um, so it, it, instead of just testing for greater than 90, let's just say we're really testing for equality with 90, and by mistake I did this instead. So what do you think would actually happen? It'll, it'll definitely do the assignment, but it needs to evaluate the condition. So what's the condition here, evaluate to? Well, we saw last time that it evaluates to true, always. So if you can do the assignment here, it evaluates to true. So in fact, this uh, code inside here will always execute, just like the example we just did. So what was the recommendation I uh, said to you last time to avoid something like this from happening? Yoda. The Yoda conditionals, where you flip the two arguments around. Because you can't assign to 90, whereas you can, you can assign to a variable. So that would help you catch the error. Because this does compile and it does work. OK, uh, we saw, uh, so I mentioned that it's not a good idea to test strict equality with a floating point number because uh, it's hard to get exactly the correct value, uh, whereas sometimes you just want only a small delta around the value that you want. And so uh, try to avoid doing a strict equality with floating point. Uh, so I've mentioned this one numerous times. Anything that's zero is false, and anything that's non-zero is true. So I could actually put... Um, if, if I was testing this program to say uh, 
if the input was not zero, then I can just do this instead. Because if it's not zero, then it's evaluated to true. If it is zero, then, it, it, then by definition it's false. So I could do, equally do this as well. Um, so it's just a matter of what you're actually trying to work with. If you're testing whether the user entered two versus one, then you can't actually do that. But uh, it depends on what you're trying to actually do. Yeah, uh, an expression doesn't have to be just a comparison. It could, oops, it could be uh, just a single variable, just like I showed you, or it could just be a, a complex mathematical expression. So if, like, if the square root of x squared plus y squared is greater than uh, c squared minus blah, 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 other things, it, you can make this as complex as you want. It doesn't just have to be a single comparison. And in fact, we're going to make it a little more complex in a bit. So I mentioned I would return to this last time. So you know we have these bool variables, right? So I can set some bool variable to true, some variable to false if I wanted to. But then you may be thinking, OK, well, why do we have those if we can just put the same condition in the if statement? Because all we figured out so far is bools are useful for if statements, right? So why do we have bool variables in the first place? So the answer is something called a flag. So it signals a condition. So the idea here is that you create a bool variable somewhere up here. Then you're going to execute a whole bunch of code that uh, you can't just stick the condition into. And then maybe if some uh, event occurs, then you'll set the variable to false. It started as true, then you'll set it to false. And then after all of this code, then you'll test for the value at the end. So the idea is this. So we'll have some bool, I'm going to call it flag to be true, and then some giant set of code in here, uh, and then some uh, giant code in here, and then maybe we have some condition that occurs, and then here we set flag to false. Okay, and maybe some more complex code around this. Uh, we'll talk about uh, when this would actually be useful. It's not really useful now, but it will be when we get to the next chapter. And then after all of this complex code inside here, then we can do a test of flag. So if flag, then maybe we say uh, condition never happened, as an example. And then else, as we saw last time, we'll get, we'll get back to else in a bit. Uh, and then if flag is not true, then we say uh, condition did happen, as an example. So the, the reason why you would ever want to do this is that if, for example, this block of code is executed many times, or maybe we have multiple instances of this if statement in here, like this is a, a condition two, and then this one's some condition one, then I don't want to put these C out statements twice in here. So one in here and one in the second conditions part, right? So, uh, because I only want to print this part exactly once. So this is where a flag variable is useful. So you start with a default value, either true or false, and then through some complex code, you change the value of this flag depending on what the circumstances are. And then after all of that, then you'll check, is the flag set to true or is it to, uh, set to false? Uh, I, in fact, I use this all the time where I'm looking through some structure for my research and I'm, I'm figuring out, okay, um, the condition uh, hasn't been executed yet, so I set my default flag to false. And then I look through this structure and if I ever find uh, something that satisfies my condition, I set the flag to true. And then after all of that, all that checking, I know that the condition for this structure is actually true. And so therefore, I can infer something about that structure. But all we're uh, thinking about here is just making our code easier to understand. So if I wanted to print this code exactly once, then I only need to have one line in here to 
signal that I need to print the right thing later. I don't need to worry about printing these statements, this condition never and condition did happen inside here. I don't have to worry about that. I only need to worry about it at the very end. Okay, so any questions on what a flag is? Uh, is just, yeah. Sorry, this is about the if statement. Uh -huh. I think we mentioned it, but when you put if and flag, does that mean oh, uh, that input yeah. equals equals like, true? Yeah, the good question. So that's just true, right? Right. So, uh, if, so whenever I put if some Boolean variable, like flag in this case, is exactly the same thing as testing for equality with true. So remember that uh, I can just put a single variable in here, and as long as it has a non-zero value, meaning one or true, then, uh, then I'm checking for if the flag in this case is set to true. Uh, what if I did, uh, we haven't covered this, but think about, what do you think this means? If I said, if not flag, what do you think that means? So it's inverting the condition. So here, the not flag just means if the flag is not true, uh, and then the else corresponds to the flag being true. Uh, if I wanted to do not flag like this, it's equivalent to say flag equals equals uh, false. It's the same thing. We'll get to this in a second. But any questions on uh, if statements and flags? Remember, flag, all it is is just a, a Boolean variable. That's all it is. It's nothing really special. Okay. Apologies to all the flags. <laughs> uh, okay, so here's just an example of this. So um, let's just say we have a Boolean variable that corresponds to the user entered the, a correct valid number of months. So if they enter negative one months, that may make sense in some context, but probably it doesn't in this one. So then if the months is less than zero, as an example, then we set... Uh, set our bool variable back to false. And so then when we test it later, then we could just make a check. Uh, did the check pass? So did the user really enter a valid number of months? If they did, then we can actually do the calculation. An example of this, uh, where this would really be used, is like in a bank, for example. Suppose that you're viewing a transaction coming in, and maybe the transaction is uh, withdraw a million dollars from this account. What should you check about the transaction first? Oh, well, yeah, if there's that much money in the account as an example, what's another thing you might want to check? Is it a valid transaction? If they put like the wrong name on the person or something, should you have that transaction go through? Probably, I don't know anything about trans. Yeah. But, uh, you have to check the data, right, to actually be, be sure that it's correct. This is actually a big security issue where um, in forms, when you're typing a form or like inputting your password or something, then it does the check on your computer that you uh, enter the correct number of digits on your computer, but it doesn't recheck it on when it's sent back to the server. And that's actually a, a big security issue. Because the, you can have the website pass, but then you can maliciously create a, a bad packet to be sent back to the server, and then all haywire happens there, even though it passed on your end. So checking in on both ends is a good idea. So, um, so an example of that is like a bank, where you have to recheck that it's a valid transaction back on the server. Okay, so you can use um, integer flags too. So it's not, flags are, aren't just uh, unique to Boolean variables. Remember, it's not really that special. It's just that, um, it's just some signal that you want to occur. So uh, as an example, we can have an integer that's set to zero, and then if some condition passes, we can set it to some other value like one, and then we can test for uh, some value here. I could equally do this for a string. So maybe I can have some string be some default value, and then if this if, uh, condition occurs, then we set it to some other string, uh, as an example. And then all the way at the very end, we check uh, some other condition, and then we print the corresponding string, either the default one or the one that passed the if statement. 
So it's not just that is a Boolean or an int. It could be anything. It can be any variable that changes value halfway through. Okay, so I promised I would get back to if else. So we know if statements uh, pretty well right now. So if some condition is true, we execute the statement set inside that corresponding if statement. But if we want uh, all the cases for when that if statement is not true to go to some other statement set, then we will put an else right here. So an example of this might be if the user entered a, value, uh, a valid number of months, for example, then we execute some statement set. Else, meaning that they did enter a wrong number of months, then maybe in this second statement set, we can say, uh, print to the user, you entered an invalid number of months, you fool, try again. So uh, that would be an example of an if else statement because you want exactly one of the two statement sets to be executed. You don't want both of them to occur, but also you don't want none of them to occur either. So uh, this is just a pretty picture like before. If the condition, so we check the condition. If it's true, we go one way. If it's false, we go the other way. But in either case, we will execute something, either the first statement set or the other one. So an example of this, well, two of them, I guess, would be uh, if the interest rate is at, uh, strictly bigger than zero, then we do the valid calculation. Otherwise, you know in no interest, woohoo. Right, so uh, this is an example of where we don't want this statement set, these two lines up here, uh, and the bottom line right here to both execute. We don't want both of them to execute because uh, printing the interest and saying you know interest doesn't actually really make sense in this context. So if else is just a mutual exclusion type thing. You want exactly one of the two to occur, but you don't want both or neither to occur. But sometimes you want two different statement sets, but you want either both of them to occur possibly or neither to occur possibly, or just one. All four cases are possible. So in this case, you don't want to use an if, uh, sorry, you don't want to use an else statement. In this case, you want to use two or more if statements. So as, as an example here, think about a number. Can a number be positive and even at the same time? Yeah, well, it's an example. Two, that, that's a perfectly valid example. So uh, that would pass both to, uh, of these if statements. What would be an example of one that doesn't pass either statement? Ne negative three as an example. Yeah, because it is not positive and it's odd. So it wouldn't pass either statement. So in this case, because a number can be both positive and even or one or neither, then we want to use two if statements. We don't want an else here. But think about even and odd. Can a number be uh, neither even or odd? Or does a number have to be even or odd? Yeah, it has to be an even or odd. Is there an example of a number that's neither of them? No, there isn't one. So in fact, we do want an else in this case because we want exactly one of the two statement sets to execute. We don't want a case where it just goes through and doesn't do either of them or it does both of them because there's no number that's both even and odd. Okay, so thinking about when you want to use an if and else or just multiple ifs is actually uh, pretty important. Any questions on that? Okay, so, but of course, uh, we hinted at this last time. Sometimes we want to have a lot of conditions, right? We just don't, we don't want to have just one condition and an else maybe. We want to have an if something, and then if it doesn't satisfy that, uh, then we do a different if statement and then a different if statement and then continue on uh, that way. So that is something called an if else chain. So the idea here is that we look at the first condition upstairs and if it's true, then we execute some statement set and skip all the others. Okay? 
So if we execute statement set one, for example, we skip all of the other statement sets. But if condition one is not true, then we check the next condition and then look at statement set two if possible and then skip if necessary. Then we just blast through the conditions depending on what the case may be. So here's an example. Um, if it's raining, take an umbrella. So uh, if it's not raining, are we going to take an umbrella? No. Uh, but if it's not raining, it could either be windy or not windy, depending on uh, the case may be. So if it's not raining, meaning we came down to the second part right here, then we need to make another check whether it's windy or not. So if it is windy, then we'll take a hat. But if it uh, failed both the raining and the windy condition, then we're going to come down to the sunny uh, condition and check that one. Question for you. Is it possible uh, that we fail all three if statements here? Yeah, it is possible. What if we did this instead? And I eliminated that. Could it be possible to go through the entire thing without taking anything? No, because this else at the very bottom catches anything that failed all the other if statements. Okay? So this is something called a trailing else. It's the else that is trailing after all of the if statements from before. So, it, of course, sometimes you do want a trailing else, sometimes you don't. Okay? Uh, it, it really depends on the circumstance. So... Uh, this would be an example, um, although these um, may not be the correct terms anymore, but uh, let's just look at this. So if the age is at least 21, we may probably consider that to be an adult. If So look at this, this else if age at least 13, what is that really testing? Else if age at least 13, what do you think that's really testing? It's greater than 13 for sure, but what is it implicitly also testing? Less than 20. Uh, uh, sorry, less than or equal to 20, right, if it's an integer, right? Uh, because it's an else if. Now, what if we did this instead? We remove the else right here. What, what would that be checking? What if I entered 15? What would that say? It would print adult and teen, right? Could it be possible that a person is both an adult and teen in, in this case? No. I mean, in the real world, maybe. But uh, so this is not a social dynamic class. <laughs> uh, but uh, just for simplicity, uh, it doesn't really make sense for a person to be both this and this. They, they stick to one of the two. So therefore, we want an if, else if, else if, uh, all the way through. And so uh, this one, uh, we can understand, means it's testing between 2 and 12 because that means it failed the at least 21 and the at least 13 check, which means that if it came down to here, it's between 2 and 12. And then what do you think this uh, last else is implicitly checking? If it's not greater than or equal to 2 in this case. But in general, it just means it failed all of the if statements. That's all it means. It's a catch-all uh, statement. So, uh, yeah. So this default statement, it just means it catches everything else. It's the last else in the chain. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's usually for catching invalid values. So... Like if they entered an in, so here's an example of, of a bug in this code. What if the user enters negative one? It prints baby. Does that make sense? Could a person be negative one years old? I, I'm not going to say anything, <laughs> but uh, probably not. So this is an example of where you will need another if statement. So what would be a, a good if statement to go here without the autocorrect? What would be a good if statement to go here to, to check for baby? Greater than or equal to zero. 
right? So that would be a good if statement, probably, uh, for checking if some if a person's a baby in this case. And then, uh, uh, what do you think an else block at the very end would? What should we print in a final else uh, thing at the very end? In invalid value because there's no person, as far as I'm aware, who has negative age other than Benjamin Button. But um, yeah, that's the only person I know. So that would be a catch all invalid uh, part. Okay, any questions on this? Okay, so uh, someone asked this last time, I think. Um, you can have nested if else's. So remember the code corresponding to an if? Anything can actually go inside that if statement. So it's just a bunch of statements. So you can think of it as you can put anything inside an if statement, right? So uh, I can put nested if statements. I can have if statements within those if statements. In fact, in some of my research, I have a six nested deep if statement sometimes. So it, it really depends on the circumstance uh, and that you need nested if statements. Um, what could be an, oh, oh, we haven't gotten there. So any questions on what a nested if statement is? So it's just an if statement within, within another one. Can I put if statements within an else block? Yeah, so it's just a bunch of statements, right? It's just a, a barrier to go to execute some other code uh, to check a, a con whether a condition's true or not. Yeah, so all this is, don't really worry about it, just put uh, curly brackets because uh, this else corresponds to this if, the second if right here, not the first one. So put curly braces around everything. <laughs> It make, it'll make your life so much easier. Uh, and indentation, but that's not actually necessary. But curly braces are much better. So when would you want an if, else, if chain like this? So an example would be a menu. So uh, this is actually the basis of your assignment three, uh, assignment two, sorry, where you are going to in and out and you are uh, looking at menu items, right? So then you have the user enter a menu item and maybe like some double doubles, for example, and then you check whether they entered a valid number of double doubles, right? And then you work onto the next menu item and the next one, and then you calculate the total at the end. So this is somewhat different. So a menu in this case would be something like this. So uh, what we would have is a menu that works like this. So here's, let's just say the menu. It's not like a restaurant menu, but it's a menu where you have options listed. So an option in this case would be, uh, let's just say we want, if we want them to enter the letter A, we want to do some action, maybe uh, update their pin number, for example. So then we can have update pin number, what would be another option? Let's just say for a credit card. Uh, cancel. Uh, uh, card. And then what would be another one? Oh, sorry? Update uh, yeah, yeah, update address would be a good one. So let's just do these to be simple. So then what we would do here is we're going to have the user enter a character. Well, char uh, input, let's just do and then we'll see in that input. What we would do is we'll check if the user entered the character A, then we will do the code corresponding to A, which is update the pin number in this case. So if input equals equals the character A, then we'll do the update pin. What should I do for B? Should I do an if or an else if? Actually, both would work here. Why? Right. Can the input both be one character and another one? No, it has exactly one value. But consider this. Suppose I was malicious or whatever, and I did this. Oh, we haven't covered that. Uh, let's just do this. And then let's just say I did just a normal if like this. What do you think that plus one did? 
it actually went to both. Remember, a character is just a number. It's just an integer. And the character B is one after the input. Okay? And so by doing this, it goes through the first if statement. Let's just say it executes. And then the input is uh, added one to it. So now it becomes B. Well, then we'll come down here and we'll look. Oh, we are going to check this if statement and it equals B. So that means I must do that set of statements too. So this is why I always recommend doing an else if, even though you can guarantee that the values are going to be distinct. So it can't be both A and B simultaneously. So but even though uh, they can't be both, I still recommend doing else if, just in case. But if it is B, then we do the cancel card code, and then else if input equals equals C, then we'll do the update address code. What if they enter an invalid value, meaning it's not one of those three? What's that? Will anything be uh, executed here? No, it'll just skip right through. So you may want to have, uh, if you're doing a menu, for example, um, <laughs> anything else? Uh, or maybe like a D, for example, or let's just do anything else. Print this menu as an example. And then we'll have a catch all clause down here, and then we'll do uh, print the menu down here. And so uh, it depends on what you're actually trying to do. Maybe you want some values to fall through, sometimes you don't. Um, but this is how you would do a menu. So a menu is multiple items, and then you just re uh, do a check. If it's equal to this, do this. If it's equal to the second item, do this all the way through the menu. Okay, any questions on what a, yeah. Yeah, so we, we haven't done loops yet. So uh, the unfortunate consequence of this is, from what we know so far, is that uh, it'll just go through exactly once. So if they enter an invalid value, they'll have to restart the program, which is kind of annoying, right? So that's the subject of next chapter when we're going to allow you to go through as many times as necessary. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. So then with an if statement, if you put like if, like cheeseburger integer, less, is than, less zero. than zero, mm -hmm. then you put the value. You, you, then you prompt them again. So then that only runs once, right? Yeah, so it only goes once. So I specified in, the assi in assignment two mm -hmm. that you're only asking each item in the menu exactly once from top to bottom be, be, because we're not doing loops. Oh, so you will prompt them again? Yeah. Well, yeah, and I think it actually says if they enter an invalid value, then you immediately stop the program. So let's just say that they do, let's just say this is an invalid value right here. I meant to cover this. Let's just say that if they don't enter A, B, or C, let's stop the program entirely, okay? Which is where in this code, if they enter an invalid value? This bottom one, right? So it's not print menu. So we want to stop the program here. Anyone know how to stop the program? Return zero. Yeah, return zero. So you may be curious, um, if we go back to the code from before, uh, let's see. So I mentioned this way back in the earlier slides where we looked at this line right here. So we covered all of them except this return zero thing way here, and it says send zero back to the operating system. Anyone know what that means? So this return, so think of return as stop the code, right where it is, the return thing. So you may be wondering, why is there a zero here? So the convention in signaling, th so when you try to run your program, Another program is designed to run your program, okay? So when you say uh, dot slash a dot out, some other program is designed to run your program. But in order for the operating system to understand what happened with your program, your program should send something back to the original one. And what that means here is zero means 
everything executed okay. A non-zero value usually means something went wrong. Handle it according to whatever program you're working with. Okay, so the, that's what the return zero thing is. We'll talk about everything uh, with related to what return actually does when we get to functions later, but just understand for now that return zero as it is means stop the program. So in your assignment two, when you are checking for whether some inputted value is less than zero, meaning it's an invalid value, uh, at some point in that if statement, you're going to put return zero. And then, and that'll stop the program entirely. Okay? Uh, any qu other questions? Yeah. So, for like, yeah, in and out one. Mm -hmm. So, you, we probably have to put an if, else, like return zero after each, like, each burger and each fry. So, we have to do that in between. That, that is actually a really good question. Let's think about this for a second. So if they enter an invalid value, we're obviously going to do it if less than zero, uh, print invalid value, return zero. What he's suggesting is, what if we do an else with that? So let's just uh, consider that for a moment. So let's just do int input, and then uh, if input is less than zero, then we'll see out a bad value, whatever it is. And then what he's suggesting is do an else and then do all other code goes inside that else statement. Anyone uh, for this type of idea? <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyone not f uh, fond of that idea? So you can do this, but is it a good idea? Because think about it. How many things are you going to be testing for less than zero? Six. Uh, uh, six. Let's just say six. So that means that we're going to have some if statement right here, then an else, and then an, uh, inside here we're going to have an if, and then else. And then it's just going to continue like this, right? Will this work? Yes. Yeah, so there's nothing actually wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with it. But is, is it harder to maintain? Yeah. yeah. So what would be a, a more maintainable idea? I'm not saying it's a wrong idea or you shouldn't do it, because sometimes you do need to do that. But do I need to do that in this case? Well, think about it. If we had some code down here, like uh, do another CN input or whatever, uh, do I need to worry about when, when they entered an invalid value here that they're going to do something else here? No, because when we are in here, we're going to return zero anyway, right? Because if we enter here, then the program stops anyway. So then I don't have to worry about it. There's an implicit else here. If this condition is not true, it's going to go through anyway. So it's not a case of where if it did go inside the if statement, it's going to continue anyway. It's going to stop no matter what. So in this specific case, uh, I advocate doing it this way because it's more maintainable. But in some cases where you don't return zero in the if part or the else part, and then you have code after it, then you may need to have a nested if statement. So Either approach is perfectly okay. There's, there's nothing inherently wrong with either one, but it, obviously I think in this case it's more maintainable, and it works in this case. So, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So if we like put the if else before like each, like if we put it in the beginning of the program, will that work for each menu item? Uh, it has to occur uh, uh, right after you input because okay. Uh, the if it, because remember it works from top to bottom. So if you input right, if you input right here and the if statement's up here, the, it, it, it won't do the condition. So it has to be right after. Yeah, yeah. Did you use a flag to do this whole like process? Yes. Do in fact a flag is a good choice here because uh, actually think about it for a second. Is a flag a good idea here? 
Yeah. Well, what's the specification for when we have uh, a bad value entered? What what happens to the program? Uh, it prints and then what happens to the program? It stops. It stops. So then I don't have really a need for a flag variable because if it blasts through that and it makes it way through the if statement and it skips the return zero, then everything is okay anyway. So you don't actually need a flag in this case. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you can do that too. Yeah, but then the problem is that they're going to be asked again to input something, even though the program should be uh, stopped anyway. So it depends on the behavior of the program. Okay, I'll see you all on Wednesday.